All right, garden maintenance and monitoring for pests. This is my favorite topic. I absolutely love garden maintenance. I know it sounds funny, but it's what the garden is all about. We're going to get out there. Uh, we're going to get in our gardens. We're going to do the tasks. We're going to do the, all the cleanup. We're doing the trimming. Um, we're going to be monitoring for pest problems. And that's just what happens when we're out in that garden. But specifically right now, we're going to be picking up any food crops we did not eat. So uh, we want to pick up those apples. We want to cut down those tomato plants. I'm sorry if you're still holding on. Uh, some of us in some areas of the Bay Area, those tomato plants might still be looking good. But really, once the frost comes, they start to get mushy. Those summer squash plants can get cut back. But ultimately, we want to remove any food that's either on the ground or in the plant because it is going to attract pests. Uh, so we want to prevent those pests like those fruit flies, the ants, the rodents. Um, and keeping in mind, if you have apples on your property, if we keep those apples uh, on the ground, yes, they will decompose and offer food, but we can also be harboring some codling moth larvae or some codling moth eggs. So we really want to make sure we're removing any of these food crops because they could be harboring pests that could overwinter. We also want to uh, look at removing any diseased leaves, like maybe from our roses and get them into our green waste bin, that municipal uh, waste bin to take it off site. We do not want to put any diseased uh, branches, twigs, or limbs or leaves into our home compost because our home compost is not going to be hot enough for long enough to kill those pathogens. We also uh, are going to see more slugs and snails. They're definitely more active during the winter months because they love that cool, moist environment. So we're going to inspect where those hiding places are, oftentimes it's under the lip of a pot or the raised bed or in the, uh, you know, the thickness of that plant because they like to hide from that sun. They're a little bit like vampires. So we're going to hand pick them off. We're going to wear gloves to do that. And we're going to uh, either put them into a bucket of soapy water, feed them to the chickens, throw them out on the lane so people can step on them, whatever. I know it can be gruesome, but we're going to manage those slugs and snails and reduce their hiding places or inspect their hiding places regularly. And this is really fun. Many of us might be, this is a campaign that's building some strength. So we're hearing about it more. I've certainly been seeing it on my social media outlets, but believe it or not, leave the leaves. We have all these beautiful leaves falling right now from our deciduous plants. That is mother nature's mulch. That plant is feeding itself by dropping its leaves. Those leaves are going to drop it's going to be mulch that protects that root zone. Just like Charlotte said, it's, it's going to be falling right where it needs to go at that drip line of that plant to insulate the root zone. And then as it break, those leaves break down, they're actually feeding the microbiology around that root zone. Um, but what else, another thing that happens is that, um, Insects will overwinter in these leaves. Birds are going to come around scratching, looking for food in the form of these insects. Uh, so leaving the leaves is actually doing a tremendous uh, job on helping build the health of the garden ecology. Uh, however, we do want to rake those leaves off of ground cover or off of perennials or succulents because we don't want to smother them. But when we're areas that we can leave the leaves, like in this picture where it's in between those succulents and perennials, please do, because they are going to really provide so much benefit for the butterflies, the bees, the moths, um, and more and more. Something else I really like to uh, do is invite the birds because the birds really help keep the gardens in balance. And another way to invite birds is to allow our plants to complete their life cycle. So uh, yes, I will deadhead my perennials uh, throughout the, the their blooming season. But when I know that their blooming season is coming to an end, I will leave the remaining flowers so that they can go to seed 
and they can go to berry and complete that life cycle because all of these, and this is just a small example of some of the plants in my garden, uh, but all of these are providing such wonderful uh, nutrition for our birds uh, in the form of seeds for food or fluff for nests and so forth. So when we can uh, allow plants to complete their life cycle, especially berries from our native plants, we're providing important nutrients for the birds and others in the garden food train food uh, chain uh, to get through the winter uh, with um, and withstand those long, cold months. And it's just fun to see the birds visiting the garden. Another really cool thing that I've started doing in my garden, and this is not going to be for everyone uh, because it's not, it's a different aesthetic. So just change your level of tolerance. But now I will prune my perennials. This is a picture of my Shasta daisies on the left with a higher stock at about 18 inches because our native bees, we have uh, so many species of native bees throughout the Bay Area. Um, many of them are going to take advantage of these stocks and lay their eggs using the stems as a nursery. So they're going to lay their eggs stacked between a layer of pollen and possibly a little piece of a leaf or some other material. And then when the, lar the egg hatches, the larva has the pollen to feed off of and then will emerge as an adult bee. So this is pretty cool. And something else I'd just like to share. I love uh, this website, uh, healthyyards.org, but they had this great illustration and this quote that's changing your yard practice might be the easiest way to fight climate change and support your local ecosystem. So it's looking at our gardens, especially during this time of the year, as um, they don't have to be completely clean and pristine. We talk about preparing our gardens for winter, but a lot of that preparation means messy, allowing things to be messy. However, messy in that balanced way that things are going to be healthy, but it's a healthy mess. We're also going to see more mushrooms in our gardens, once, uh, um, which is not a bad thing. Uh, they do pop up when the soil is moist, especially after uh, the rains begin. Uh, mushrooms uh, do help break down nutrients and they feed our plants. Um, they are often signs of a really healthy ecosystem. So that's really important to understand. Uh, they are the fruiting bodies of the underground mycelium that moves through the soil. Uh, we do want to carefully and properly identify um, the mushrooms because it's important to understand exactly uh, if they're, um, you know, just there, you know, given their show, or is it an indicator it, that it is, if, especially when they're in close proximity to a tree, there could be something else going on, you know? So it's always important when we are making these decisions about removing mushrooms uh, to understand one, are they close to a tree? And if so, we're going to want to take some photos of that mushroom, maybe take a sample and bring it to our local UC cooperative extension for them to properly identify so that we can then address if it's something that is you know, just going to be a normal part of our environment of that garden, or if it's something that's going on with the health of that tree. Uh, if the mushrooms uh, are not welcome in your garden, then again, we're going to wear gloves and we can just hand pick them and put them in the green municipal waste bin. But they are short lived. And after a couple of days, they usually just disappear. And then, of course, since the rains have arrived, uh, we've already started to see some pop up. I've seen the oxalis, Charlotte. I've seen it already. And I'm like, Rrr. so uh, we do want to keep weeds in check. Uh, definitely that layer of mulch is going to suppress them. But uh, we want to keep in mind that we are not going to manage the weeds when the soil is wet. 
But once that soil has dried out some and we can walk on it without compacting it, we can hoe them at first sight or, you know, hand pull them or manage them in some way. The big takeaway though, because a lot of times we're not out in the garden during the winter months because it's cold and wet. The big takeaway is to make sure you're trimming these weeds before they go to flower. Uh, and especially before they go to seed, because once they have, we are going to be combating weeds for years. Weeds are very tenacious and their seeds can stay uh, viable in the soil for years to come. So that uh, crabgrass you're managing right now, it's from crabgrass that went to seed years ago. So just keep that in mind. And another tip I can share is that we're going to store and stack and clean and clear our potting benches. Uh, we want to make sure that any saucers that are not being used are upside down. And we also want to kind of clean up our, our pottery, our containers, and have them stacked nicely because this is also going to prevent um, slugs and snails, rodents, and anything else that might want to uh, take up a nice hiding place over the winter months. If there's a little bit of soil and it's not upside down and it's kind of tucked away, oftentimes we find them uh, liking to nest in these areas. And then of course, any water pooling and saucers that aren't upside down will be uh, a new home for mosquitoes that we do not want. And then another tip I can share is that since we are going to move towards some frostier nights, we're going to protect tender plants. So not all plants are frost tolerant. So um, many plants that we might have in our garden could be tropical, such as geraniums or citrus. Um, and some annuals, they'll need protected from frost. So, but many winter edibles, like that list of winter uh, food crops that I mentioned earlier, are actually quite hardy. So those peas, the lettuce, the onions, the cauliflowers, and so forth, these are all going to be very frost tolerant. Um, and they can really withstand temperatures as low as 25 degrees. So if it's going to get below that, we want to keep that in mind for the frost uh, tolerant uh plants in the garden. But um, anything else, uh, we're going to really want to make sure we're protecting from frost. So here's a couple tips. When frost is on the forecast, we want to make sure the plants are hydrated. So Sloat does an excellent job of giving out uh, frost alerts, which I uh, love because that's my, okay, that's my little indicator. Okay, get outside, make sure I've put the frost blankets on or I'm spraying with the um, anti-transference. But something that's important is to make sure the plants are hydrated. If we haven't had a rain, um, our irrigation systems are off. We just want to make sure that soil is not bone dry because if we have a frost, uh, plants with uh, bone dry soil around the root zone is going to be more prone to frost damage. So we just want to make sure that is lightly hydrated, not super soaked or anything. We also want to put that nice layer of mulch on that root zone because that's also going to insulate the root zone. It's going to insulate that soil around that root zone, keeping it warmer and it's going to protect it. And if we've got smaller containers, plants in smaller containers, if we can move them up close to the house or the shed or the garage, that they'll be more protected from the heat from that structure. Um, we want to also, uh, oh, when we use row cover, or I'm sorry, frost blankets, yeah, row cover can be used as frost blankets, but frost blankets cannot be used as row cover. So if you have row cover on hand, you can use that. But it's important to use the material. Um, Frost blankets are designed to really protect the plants, to let moisture wick through. Uh, it's not really ideal to use a sheet or a blanket, but if that's all you've got, go ahead. But it's really best to actually just get the proper material because it's designed to do that job. Um, if wind is a problem, we're going to want to anchor that uh, those frost blankets, sometimes at clothespins or with bricks or stones around the plants to make sure it's not going to blow away. Um, and then these anti-transparents are excellent during the heat of the summer, but they're really excellent during the frosty nights. It's actually just a protective layer 
that is going to keep moisture in and um, prevent evergreens, uh, evergreen trees, shrubs, and fruit trees, such as citrus, from um, it's going to provide them a little bit of frost protection during those frosty times.